Hey guys, welcome back to a Kerbal Space Program video. It's been so long. I actually I think it's only been like a week for you guys, but for me, it feels like a lifetime. Um, I had a lot of plans for what to do as the comeback video because I couldn't upload anything last Saturday or Wednesday, my dudes, because uh, I've been moving house. But I've kind of finished moving now, like I still have a lot of stuff to do. So I might not have time for Planet Coaster content, but at the very least, I'm pretty sure Kerbal Space Program content can come back to a degree. The plan for this week's video actually was a lot more ambitious than what it is. This is a roving base, if it wasn't clear from the title and thumbnail, mainly because I wanted to try out the new rover cockpit that has been added to the game, or rather janked into the game, I guess, because the massively uh, unbalanced Mark II lander has finally been updated to be good, and it has this rover capsule variant. I wanted this thing to be a big base though, so I kind of strung three of them together to make an extra wide cockpit, but I think, you know, that stands. But anyway, my original plan for this video was um, going to be an SSTO mission, but that turned out that I only allowed myself like two days to make the video, like two evenings, and the kind of SSTO I wanted to make was a little bit too ambitious to do in that time frame, so I basically have tonight to make a video. So I thought, what can I do? um in this video so i'd had i had this little craft file like made for a little while so I thought, let's just let's just make use of it so this commentary is kind of split into two parts or commentary i say video is kind of split into two parts we have this bit here which is the building phase because a lot of people when they see my more arty <laughs> builds like rovers bases that sort of thing they like sort of seeing the process by which it's made they say how do you make these things and stock ksp this is how the actual flight is about six minutes ish in if you want to just skip to that part but i feel like a lot of people like the time lapses so that's why that's why there's a time lapse. Um, the other reason uh, I didn't have much time to make today's video is because I live in Plymouth, which is in the southwest of England. England never really does well with extreme weather, be it very, very hot weather or very, very cold weather. And Plymouth is just especially true for because Plymouth is generally a fairly warm place. We never really get snow here. The last time we had snow was actually last year, admittedly, but before that, <laughs> it was like 10 years ago. So we're not very well equipped to deal with snow. And on the way back from work, it started actually properly snowing. And because Plymouth is not used to the snow, whenever the snow falls, the entire city comes to a complete standstill. It took me like, I live like two miles at most from work and it took me probably about two hours to make it home because this traffic just, 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 it just was not moving. So that was a, that was a bit of a thing that I had to deal with. So I got, I raced back in. I've literally got a thing I have to go to in like 20 minutes. So this is, I may be naturally talking a little bit faster because for me, there's a sense of urgency. I guess I am restricted by the speed of the playback of this video. So I should probably relax myself a little bit, but you know, I, uh, <laughs> they're always there yeah that's that's why I was, i'm in a little bit of a rush but i hope that you still enjoy the video nonetheless it's been a while since i did a roving base i didn't do any roving bases in 2018 and so i thought we'd send this one to the man because the man i haven't even got a base no i, I have got a base established on them i've just realized well whatever i'd forgotten i had a man base when i made this video uh, but i haven't got a roving base on the MUN, so this is still relevant. The last time I sent a roving base to the MUN was on my old save file, and as you know, earlier last year, I ditched that save file in celebration of 100,000 subscribers and started a new one. So we should probably put a roving base on the MUN at some point in, a, in this save file's life. I would like to send a rover somewhere more ambitious. Uh, the original plan for this rover was actually to send it to the Drez Canyon, but then I had a much, much, much better idea for a Drez Canyon like roving base. So that'll be in a future video for sure. Uh, but that's why in some parts of this video, this rover might end up being called Drez Canyon Roving Base. But that's why I thought of a better idea for the for a Dres Canyon base, and also this didn't end up having enough delta V in the uh, vacuum stage of the rocket in order to, it, to get to Dres. I massively undercalculated how much fuel it had for some reason. I don't know what it was because I feel like I did the numbers at the time and it had enough delta V. I think I must have just changed something somewhere along the way, or the more likely situation of the two, I just miscalculated something and forgot to factor in a certain burn or something like that. Either way, we didn't have enough delta V. So we're going to go to the MUN. But you know, the MUN is basically the same as Dres. I think we can all agree. Now here, you can see I've added these air brakes to the bottom of the rover. I added those just because like if the rover is going to be stationed in one area for a long time, it might be a cool idea to have it so it can raise its wheels off the ground just so they don't get damaged. I know that in space, admittedly, there isn't really any weather, so... I'm not sure how useful this feature is. Well, I say that. I, w I wasn't sure at the time how 
useful this feature is, but it turned out that later in this video, those air brakes play a crucial role in the success of the mission. Oh, you guys better stick around and wait for all the twists and turns, I'm sure. Anyway, as I said earlier in this video, and just generally on Twitter and Discord, I'm in the process of moving house. I'm pretty much moved in, but there are still uh, T's to cross and I's to dot, mainly with my office. I've been putting up like soundproofing foam just so I don't get as much reverb in these videos. It's nearly done, but uh, there's still a little bit of work to do. I got one of those uh, sit to stand desks, you know, the ones where you can press a button and it raises up and down just because I feel like I, I'm aware of how bad for you sitting is. So I thought, let's get a, a sit to stand desk. I'm also looking at getting a nice chair. I don't, I don't know what yet, but I need something better than a wooden kitchen chair. Um, but that's all going to be, I haven't decided what I'm going to get just yet for the chair. So stay tuned for the chair video. <laughs> I'm sure maybe, I don't know. I think gaming, a lot of people like gaming chair reviews and stuff. I'm probably not going to get a quote unquote gaming chair. But I'll get a. I probably won't do a video. I don't know. I just don't really know what to talk about at this specific point in the video because the time lapse for the build has finished. Here's me doing one little final test. Went very well, as I'm sure you can see. Let's brush that aside and cut to, not cut, fade to the launch platform. There is the rocket. So, as I said, this thing was originally going to be for Drez, but then I forgot to add enough fuel. <laughs> Gosh, what good planning. Uh, I forgot to add enough fuel to the upper stage. So. We're going to go to the Mun, which is why this rocket is pretty overbuilt for a Mun rocket. At least it looks like a rocket shape. The last Mun rover I sent wasn't in a very conventional looking rocket. It had like a catamaran style thing with a giant fairing in the middle and two Saturn V straps to either side. This is a little bit more conventional. The Separatrons weren't properly attached to those side boosters and nearly had a bit of a disaster when they detached, but it was no, no problem in the end. Gonna just do a fairly standard ascent really, gravity turn, gradually turning over so that we're tipping 45 degrees by the time we hit 10 kilometers roughly. Didn't do a particularly efficient job there, but I think for the most part it was fine. Again, we have enough delta V for the mission. And then we're just gonna go bound uh, for space, I guess. A plot point that probably didn't need establishing given this is a Kerbal Space program video, and of course the title and thumbnail show a rocket, or a rover I should say, very much in space. But again, kind of stalling really. I feel like I talked way too fast at the beginning and I've very quickly exhausted all the topics I wanted to talk about. But you know, moving, the process of moving is always a good topic to talk about in this video which is now going to be a moving vlog but with a Kerbal Space Program gameplay thing in the background rather than my face which is probably um, best for everyone. <laughs> uh, I bought one of those um, TVs, a <laughs> one of those TVs, one of those 4K TVs in my living room. It's only a 50 inch Plasma, no not plasma, 50 inch LED, it's not an OLED, I couldn't afford an OLED, but it's like the one below that, it's a pretty nice TV, put it that way, nice 4K, 50 inch, which apparently is quite small now in the current market, most of them are bigger than that, I feel like it just about fits in my front room, so that's good, but I've just been playing, I plugged my GameCube into it, I plugged my GameCube into it, and it's funny how badly the GameCube graphics have aged, like certain, there are certain games. For example, uh, Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is probably the obvious choice when it comes to GameCube games that have aged well graphically. Uh, Beautiful Joe is another example. Generally, most of the first part in Nintendo games are pretty good. Twilight Princess, mm, starting to get a little bit janky. But just like art style aside, the graphics themselves, like, because obviously the GameCube wasn't an HD console. And it looks terrible. <laughs> or they, I mean, I'm not surprised. I guess I'm not surprised. I don't really know what I was expecting. But I was just, I, I was just playing. I was thinking, my goodness, it's actually really hard to play this game because I can barely see the details on the screen. I think I've just been spoiled by modern technology. I should probably get like, I was thinking about getting a PS4 Pro, mainly so I could play 4K Blu-rays because I have a 4K TV, but I've only got a PS3 to play Blu-rays. But the PS4 doesn't even play 4K Blu-rays, and the Xbox One X does, but the Xbox One is a terrible console, unfortunately, because um, that means that Sony almost has a monopoly on the console market at this point, which is never good. But uh, yeah, the Xbox One has 4K Blu-ray playback, but the PS4 doesn't. And I could have sworn that Sony owned the rights, as in like they own the technology to Blu-ray. So it seems a little bit ironic that they ha their console doesn't, but their main competitor does. I thought that was a little interesting tidbit, so I'll probably just get... I'll probably get a PS4 Pro just because then I could do a KSP review, uh, enhanced edition, so it could be classed as a business expert. No, I wouldn't do that. But I could do a KSP uh, enhanced edition review, um, do some other games like Red Dead, um, 
Bloodborne. I feel like it's a bit late now to jump on the Bloodborne bandwagon, but I would probably play that nonetheless. And just, you know, enjoy my life as a PlayStation 4 owner, I guess. I haven't really got many other things to talk about there. But I can also set up my Steam Link. I bought a Steam Link about a year ago when it was on sale for £3. Now I can finally use it. It's all, it's all very exciting times, guys. Exciting times ahead as we get our Mun encounter. Going for a fairly low periapsis because we have a stupid amount of Delta V. We have 2,300 meters per second near enough to perform our landing. And given that we don't have to bother returning because our Kerbal is going to be living on this base, we, we, it's too much. It's too much Delta V. But I was trying to think where else to go other than the Mun or Minmus. Minmus takes even less Delta V to get to than the Mun, or at least less Delta V to land on than the Mun. And there's Juna, but Juna would be a bit difficult to land this thing on with no parachutes. It would probably be fine, to be honest, but I've... I was about to say I've done a Juno roaming base, but I've, I've done a Mun roving base as well, so I guess it's a bit of a moot point. Although I think... I don't know. The main thing I wanted to do with this video, I feel like this is such a bad time to establish this because I only just got to it. I should have been talking about this point during the time lapse, but whatever, we're going to go with it anyway. One of the things I've always done with my roving base is I've used the smaller wheels, like not the tiny ones, but the metal wheels that are the smaller than these ones. I don't really know how else to describe them. I don't know what their name is, but I just use a bunch of those because I've always hated the way these big wheels look. And I still think they look a bit weird, but I think I finally came up with a design that kind of makes them look okay. I did have to clip them into the body of the craft, but for the most part, I don't know, what, how do you guys think this rover looks? I think it came out all right. I, that was, I don't know, that was always my big problem with these wheels. I find they're pretty ugly and cumbersome and hard to make them look good on a craft, unless you're like building a replica of the Saturn V crawler or something like that. I don't know. I've always, I've always found them a little bit difficult to uh, incorporate into a craft, but I think this is about as good as I'm going to get with uh, these wheels. Maybe if I put more effort into them, I made like custom shrouding using like the fair, not the fairing pieces, the wing parts and stuff around the wheel, like suspension parts, I can make it look even better. But you know, for the most part, I'm pretty happy. So now we're on the final rocket stage of this uh, craft and we're using the vector engines. A couple of reasons, A, because they have huge gimbal to help us control this uh, massively unbalanced payload. And also they have very good thrust to weight ratios. It's very easy to quickly kill off all our speed and make sure we're touching down at the right speed without having to worry about timing a suicide burn or anything. Now this is where things started to get a little bit tricky. I'm going to just drop the thing down to real time speed now. We're going to touch down nice and slowly. I think you can all agree this is a pretty reasonably slow speed. Touch down and then, as you can see, it didn't work. So we can just uh, <laughs> quickly reload that. Try again, thought maybe we like touch down a little bit too fast. So let's slow ourselves down even more. Unfortunately, because we have to tilt forwards, there wasn't much I could do. So I was thinking at this point, we might have to abandon this mission here because it's clearly the fact that the wheels are clipped into the body of the craft that's causing this cracking to happen. Try, let's try one more time. Slower, slower, again, nothing. So I was thinking, oh no, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to disappoint, I was gonna disappoint the viewers, but probably it's a relief that you guys don't have to enjoy one of these videos for another week. But regardless, I think, in, you know, we probably have to abandon And then I remembered the, the air brakes at the bottom of the craft that are designed to help this thing like be raised off the ground when it's at like one of its stationary places. I don't really know how else to describe the function of those air brakes. I thought, what about trying to land it on the air brakes? I was a bit suspicious that they might be destroyed from the impact, but their sacrifice may dampen the speed enough for us to survive the impact. But it was better than that. As you can see, the air brakes survived the impact, as did the rest of the rover. Everything worked out okay in the end. So I hope you enjoyed this little roller coaster of a side plot. We can ditch that engine stage now that we don't need it. And, uh, well, there we go. There's the rover. I guess that's pretty much wrapping towards the end of the video. I don't think I need to talk too much, waste too much more time on this video. We've landed the rover. You've had plenty of time to see it, I guess, in flight, but we can do some nice close-up shots showing you the true magnitude of this rover like it's a lot bigger once you get a curve on eva you kind of realize just how big it is and i thought let's take this opportunity to uh try out the i don't know drilling bay i guess like this thing has drills on board and an irsu unfortunately i forgot to add an ore tank that was a bit of an oversight on my part i put my hands up made a bit of a mistake there guys so this thing can't actually mine anything 
but you know it looks nice i guess uh so whoops everything else it, it, most of the stuff on this craft is pretty much there for the aesthetic to be honest like rovers as we know in ksp are pretty not that useful like i made one video that showed the actual uses for a rover it was like an eve rover so you have to worry about returning from eve which most players that's quite a tall order for some players um, but by landing it on like the coastline of eve you can get like three biomes all very close together with the rover um, but just by driving it between biomes obviously and then you can beam it back and that's like the only real useful thing i've found with rovers is for like early eve missions or early interplanetary missions something like that but you can also make cool looking craft which i guess is an, is an accomplishment of its own here we are just driving it along we'll take it to a flat area let's just cut ahead to when we get there there we go so we are now here we can deploy the solar panels using our action group to get as much power to this thing as possible although we do have lots of rtgs to generate power without the need for solar panels as well so lots and lots of juice on board this thing i think it's got like twenty-five thousand units of electric charge as well which does seem like a lot those big wheels though do drain quite a bit of power when they want to though so we do have to be careful about uh, conserving electricity there go the drills and then we can get our kerbal on the surface of the moon to do a couple of things grab some surface samples do a bit of eva reporting although we have already got signs from this particular biome not great planning on my part again whoops but there you go there's a good sense of how big this thing is next to a kerbal we can get a little bit further away from it as we uh first of all look back and then get ready to plant our flag and get the Laon aerospace logo plastered onto the surface of the moon once again and there's pretty much the rover so uh, we nearly got to the end of the video we're doing some nice little pan around shots just here um we're gonna gracefully land on here or or oh ah uh, he's not moving um yeesh that was messy sorry about that uh please don't demonetize my video youtube for showing death uh I'm sure he's fine. He's a Kerbal. They're immortal. It's fine. He'll be okay, guys. We won't have to send the blunderbirds to rescue him. He'll be fine. The end. <laughs>